Okay, we are in the 57th lesson in our studies in the book of John. We have arrived finally at a new chapter. It felt like we were in chapter 8 for quite some time. Tonight we will begin the work in the ninth chapter of John, as our title says, The Man Born Blind. We will not cover the entire story of the man born blind. He takes up a majority of the ninth chapter. His confrontation with the Pharisees, his encounter with Jesus, the miracle that, of course, uh, is the reason that his story is relevant. Um, there's a lot of good stuff, and, and it's too much to do in any one, to me, to do it justice in any one week. So this is the warning I always give before we enter a new chapter or a new story, that we will be there a little while because there's always more than meets the eye. I hope you've learned that by now, not just in my teaching, but in your own study. There's almost always more than meets the eye. If you are willing to dig in a little bit, and I'm not talking about making stuff up. I hear secondary and tertiary explanations of texts all the time, and I think that was a lot of work to miss the primary reason that scripture exists. Um, I don't ever want to be guilty of that, missing the primary so we can come up with some you know, bogus idea. Um, I don't feel like we're doing that. I, I do feel like we're hitting that surface stuff and then realizing that there's a little more below the surface and that if you dig, there's something that can connect us to other things. This whole book, it's, uh, it's all interlinear. It all works together. It's, uh, it's a masterful work because it, it, uh, it takes you down an amazing road. I'm not just talking about John. I'm talking about the entire thing. And so that's why you're always pulling all those outside sources in to find other things. What I want to do tonight, because the story is so long and we're not going to cover all of it, I want to read the main body of The Man Born Blind. Um, it's 12, well, it's longer than that, but I want to read the 12 verses that really tell his story, okay? So um, in, you just have to know that we're going to cover a bunch of stuff right here in 12 verses and say nothing about them. At least I'm really going to try to say nothing about them as we read the verses because we'll come back through and work those passages in just a moment, okay? Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. This is so hard to just read and not talk about stuff. <laughs> Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? And some said, This is he. Others said, He's like him. He said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. And they said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. And this constitutes the, the, the miracle itself. And of course, there's a bunch that happens after this. You can see why without any commentary, just reading through 12 verses, you can see why this has infatuated people for a long, long time. Quite incredible story. Jesus, who does the unique token event he never repeats of spitting on the ground, creating this little mud pie putting it across the eyelids of a man born blind and sending him away to receive his miracle. No miracle in this situation happens in front of Jesus. It happens away from Jesus. It is highly unusual in the way Jesus heals people. It is, and we'll get into that over the weeks of how unusual and why it being unusual is essential to the blind man miracles. But um, this guy has fascinated people for centuries. Um, 
because we don't know anything, we don't know much about him. We, we learn a little bit about his biography as the story, story goes on. I think we're just as intrigued by the whole spitting on the ground aspect as we are the fact that he's healed. We're not shocked he's healed, it's Jesus. I mean, how could he not be healed? We're a little shocked at the unconventional method by which Jesus decides to heal him, and there's a lot of theology in all of those reasons. But I want to do something else with this to start with. I titled it The Man Born Blind, knowing that we don't cover his whole story tonight, but I know that when people go through our series, we're going to be looking for specific miracles, and this is a good place to start when it comes to understanding what's going on in John 9. But there's something bigger happening here, and I don't, again, I said what I did a moment ago that I don't want to miss the primary to go after secondary, tertiary interpretations. So the primary thing that happens is a man is blind, Jesus heals him. Why, how, all that stuff's important and it's relevant. But there's something happening from the author John's point of view. John's placement of this miracle of the healing of the man born blind is of particular importance. Notice his placement. John's not necessarily chronological, okay? So he's putting miracles where he puts them. We're not to assume that this happened exactly after the last thing happened or exactly before the next thing happens, at least in John's account. John doesn't write that way. The sixth recorded miracle of Jesus in John's gospel, six is the Hebrew number for mankind or humanity. Again, don't assume this is the sixth miracle of Jesus' ministry, but you do know that it's the sixth miracle of John's gospel. John only gives you seven. We will assume Jesus performed many, many more. In fact, we know he did because John doesn't even include all of the miracles of Jesus in his book. John puts this miracle sixth for a reason. The Hebrews counted the number six as the number of Adam or the number of man, whereas the number seven was the number for God's perfection, God's rest, God's completion. Six is one short of seven because in the Hebrew economy, man is always one short of God at least. Man is made a little lower than the angels. That's common vernacular in Hebrew literature. Therefore, the number must be a little lower than the number that represents God. Seven comes to represent God and His perfection, His rest. John throws this miracle in number six because I think the miracle is a microcosm of God's relationship with the family of man, or it's God's relationship with man as humanity. Here's just some of the examples. We'll add to this as we go, because I think we'll have revelation all of us, as we'll start to see God do some things through this miracle. But if you're thinking along these lines over the next few weeks, I think it'll help you to start to expose some of these areas where something might be being said to you that's bigger than meets the eye. Some of them are that man is born spiritually blind. God reach, I'll, go, I'll come back to these because you already sneak ahead anyway. Man is born spiritually blind. God reaches into the earth and mingles his spirit with man's. I see that as God spitting into the dirt. And he smears man over. He sends him to wash in Siloam, a type of being baptized into Christ, and gives him new sight, new insight. So there's really a, 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 a like I say, I use the word microcosm, but it's sort of a, a, a small version of the entire encounter that God has with humanity is Jesus with the man born blind, this sixth miracle. It's God uh, intervening himself into the spiritual blindness of man. Now, there's a lot of things that, that probably I would need to defend in that statement if I were trying to build some sort of theology out of them. I'm not. I'm just trying to show you an image of what I think you can take if you look at the bigger picture. Like for instance, that man is born spiritually blind. We could argue if man is born with original sin, an argument I'm not really willing tonight to take up, but I do believe he's born spiritually blind. I do believe that he doesn't really have much insight into the love of the Father. He doesn't know anything about his own redemption. He's blind most of the time to his own deficiencies. It's why it's so much easier to judge your neighbor than it is to judge yourself because you can see what everybody else is doing wrong, but you conveniently can lie to yourself all the time. And so we're spiritually blinded not only to the things of God, but we're often spiritually blinded to ourself, and we're born that way. It's not something we learn as we go through the Christian wall or as we go through humanities. I'm learning to be blind to my own situation. We're born blind to our own situation, and it's something that perpetuates as we go. And then also, you know, I think God reaches into the earth, mingles his spirit with man's. I like that imagery. We'll get into that in future weeks of the spit and dirt um, about, uh, because, you know, the living water meets the, the, the earth. Uh, God breathes into man who's made of dirt. Uh, God mingles himself into the family of man. He becomes part of who we are. Uh, he smears us over and sends to wash in the pool of Siloam, a word that means sent in the Greek. And so Jesus, 
Christ is the sent one. Christ is our pool of Siloam. And we're baptized into Christ in the same way that he splashes himself off. Gives him new sight and new insight. Because I see those as two different things. Not only does his eyes work, but this guy preaches to the Pharisees in John 9. And so not only is it new sight, it's new insight into who God is. It's new insight into who Jesus is. And this is what God's doing with us. He's taken the scales off of our eyes that have kept us blind to who we really are. He blinds us over to who we used to be so that we can see properly in the inside of who he is. And he gives us fresh insight. We start to see things we've never seen before. So back to the text, because this is the point, this is kind of where we really kick off tonight in, in, in getting started. I, I skipped one in our rehash. One is that Jesus passing by comes through the temple and it, it's really just a pickup of where eight leaves off. Okay. Two, his disciples asked him saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. What a question. What a way to get this miracle started. Next screen. Who sinned? Typical question. The disciples are a type of all of us who excitedly follow the Lord. Now I say we with the pronoun here, understanding that hopefully we're not all this way, but I say we because I think overall as the family of man um, and as believers, a lot of us are this way. Um, we're always on a sin hunt. We're convinced that the problems of the world are a result of sin. Let me slow down there for a moment and just say that, and I, I can't assume what any of you have heard, but I've been in this long enough that I feel like if I've heard it, you probably have too if you've been in it long. And what I have found is that for the most part, wherever there's problems in the world, the church attributes those problems as the direct result of sin. So if they see people struggling, sin. In fact, we do it so often, I don't think we even realize how much attention and power we give to sin. A couple in the church have marriage problems. Somebody's probably cheating. A couple in the church is having financial problems. Somebody probably ain't tithing. Our instantaneous response to issue, who sinned? We're not much different than the disciples. We, we spot an issue we immediately identify that sin must be the source, and therefore we go on a sin hunt. I say those of us who excitedly follow the Lord, because that's what we all do. We come in, we're excited about this thing, and we want to be able to have answers, because that's what Christianity is supposed to be. We're supposed to be running around with answers. Well, the answer is there's sin in the camp. And so we preach sermons like sin in the camp from the Old Testament, where you, know, you lose a battle because somebody has sinned. And we circumvent the finished work of Christ often in those ju judgments. And we look for people who have committed error and have committed some sort of sin. Watch Jesus' response, though, to who sinned. It's verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, the first thing I want to say is I, I want to just kind of... kind of get rid of the, the, the thing that gets us tripped here. It, did, it got me tripped for a long time. I'm going to just admit it. I would read this verse and think, gosh, that's a stupid thing for them to ask. Who sinned this man or his parents? He was born blind. How could he have sinned and been born blind? And I got so tripped up on that for so long that I would even research into the, did, did Judaism of the first century have some feelings of reincarnation? And I actually uncovered some stuff that some did that there actually was some belief in that, though the Torah doesn't touch that, the Old Testament doesn't touch that. And so that could be why they're saying that he sinned in another life and he's born blind. But I think we're really missing the force for the trees with that response. I think the reality is that they are on a sin hunt and they want to figure out who has done something wrong, what's happened. And so Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents. Be careful in concluding that there could be no calamity in the world except as the result of sin. The reason you need to be careful doing that is because this is going to lead you to the assumption that wherever there is chaos, there has also been a failure. Ultimately, all problems you ever encounter will appear to either be sanctioned by God or to be brought on as judgment by God. And so you'll look at people who are having issues or you'll look at junk going on in the world and you'll say, if there is issue and there is junk, there must be sin in the camp. And therefore, the results of that are that God is allowing this to happen in that person's life in order to bring the sin to light so that the sin can be exposed. 
because we have this mentality a lot of times in the church that what God really wants to do is expose what's wrong with you, not fix what's wrong with you. He wants to expose what's wrong with you so he can humble you. Bring it to the surface, everybody knock you down, and then he gets the glory of healing you. That is a warped version of the gospel. That is a good news that demands bad news in front of it to look good because it's not very good news that God has to swoop in only after you've been knocked down by your peers. You should never have to make news bad to make the gospel good. And if you have to make news bad to make the gospel good, something's wrong with your gospel. The gospel is such good news. God loves you. He paid an incredible price to take care of your evil and your sin and your issues and to open your eyes. And he hasn't abandoned you and he'll never let anybody pull you out of his hand and he'll never leave you or forsake you. And it's great news. You've been reconciled to God. Great news. The king has come. Great news. There's a new king in charge and he is sitting on his throne. I don't need to give you bad news in front of that great news. Great news, the king's here. What bad news do you need? And if you itch inside to have some failure exposed because you think it'll bring more glory to Jesus, you are inadvertently giving more glory to sin than you are to grace. Grace does not shine brighter because you are more filthy. It is not, God doesn't look better when you look bad. He's good anyway. And, and for too long, we have felt like the best way to make Jesus look good is to make people look bad. That's low-hanging fruit, and it's lazy, and it's not the gospel. It doesn't take any talent to spot specks in your neighbor's eye. And yet it takes true self-insight to find the beam hanging out of yours. Why is it that we're so good at finding whatever is insignificantly wrong with our neighbor and ignoring all of our stuff? And why is it that we feel like the gospel would be better news if people had all their sins laid out in front of them? Particularly whenever Jesus has died at Calvary so that your sins could be judged in the cross. And then what good would it do for us to re-expose those sins so that somehow grace looks better, somehow good news looks better? Don't get caught in the trap. That everything wrong with the world is a result of sin. It's the John 9 disciple trap. Lord, who sinned? This man or his parents? Somebody had to fail. Otherwise, this guy wouldn't be blind. Because nobody can just be blind. They had to have sinned. I mean, every problem in the world is the direct result of somebody else failing, right? And Jesus goes, wrong. It's not the case that every problem in the world is the direct result of someone else failing. Because if you end up with that doctrine and that theology, then you have to question what the cross really did. It's also why, and I, let me slow down and think about this for a minute. It's also why I believe that So much of what we are putting out in the future from an eschatological standpoint is out in the future because we're disappointed in the victory the cross has given on the planet. Let me say that better. We, we see that Jesus paid for our sin. He judged evil at the cross and we see evil in the world and we go, okay, well then, that he, well, he couldn't have. Because there's still problems. So, he, I mean, he didn't really... This is why when I started preaching the finished work, I got a lot of kickback from the phrase finished work because people went, well, it's not all finished. Because if it, it's not all finished, he's going to come finish it. And I go, well, what part of finished, it is finished, did we get? I mean, he either finished my redemption or he didn't finish my redemption. If he didn't finish my redemption, what are you, what are you bragging about being saved for? What have you been saved from? Just stuff you did, but nothing you're about to do. And you certainly haven't been saved from the devil, and you haven't been saved from sin. You've just been saved from the stuff you got caught from. I mean, it's either finished or it's not finished. And so if it's finished, then maybe what's going on in the world is not the direct result of God hasn't yet taken care of that or God hasn't judged that. Maybe the things going on in the world are the natural things that go on in the world, and God wanted us to learn something in the middle of a world where things go awry. And I think that's John 9. I think it's Jesus saying, 
There's glory to be found for my father in this blindness. This blindness is not from my father. This blindness is not a result of my father. This blindness is not a result of sin. It's just blindness because people are blind. But my father can bring glory out of that blindness. My father can make something happen in the middle of it. And I call that chaos and order. Stay with me, okay? I have a comparative paragraph here. If you sneak too far ahead, you're gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna lose you, all right? <laughs> Chaos, here's what we'll do. I'll work through both of them and then we'll start to compare. Chaos underlies order. A little chaos is necessary from time to time. Don't worry about the explanations here. I'll come back and work them. Chaos in weather purifies the atmosphere. Chaos in life slows down the clock. Chaos sharpens us as it makes us reorganize to find order. Chaos can destroy us or we can find meaning that can restore order. We are better off at the end of the day. Then there's sin. Sin does not underlie holiness. A little sin is not necessary from time to time. Sin purifies nothing. Sin slows nothing, but rather it accelerates death. This is the most you've probably ever heard me talk about sin in one because I want to compare something for you, okay? Sin slows nothing. It accelerates death. Sin dulls us. It doesn't sharpen us. Sin will destroy us. Not can. Sin will. Sin will destroy us. There's no meaning in it from which we can restore order. We are never better off at the end of the day with sin. Now, why did I compare these two? Because to me, John 9 is a comparison. The disciples bring sin to the table and Jesus brings chaos to the table. The disciples say, who sinned, this man or his parents? Jesus said, neither. This is the way life is. It's full of chaos. Sometimes people are blind. My dad gets glory in taking care of the chaos of the blind. Give my father a chance to show you his glory in the middle of your calamity. But if you keep thinking that all the problems of the world are a result of sin, you have nothing to do in this world but sit around and wait to go home. Because what are you going to do with sin? You know what sin will do to you? <laughs> sin is not the converse, not the transverse of holiness. If chaos is the other side of order, sin is not the backside of holiness. Okay? They're diametrically opposed to one another. What are you going to do? A little sin's not necessary for you from time to time. Sin doesn't purify anything. Sin doesn't slow anything down. Sin accelerates death. Sin dulls you. Sin destroys you. But chaos, those areas of life that go awry, those things that, those blind men, man born blind, those instances, those things, there are things that can come good out of the things that are bad in the world. That's allowing God to do the work that he does. Let me just work through a, a few of those on that chaos side, because this is actually pretty obvious, all right? I mean, you don't, this is simple. You, no, I don't even think anybody ever believes sin underlies holiness. Although I will say this, a little rabbit trail. I, it's not really a rabbit, it's just a qualifier of that statement. I really do think that most people can only explain the holiness of God by talking about sin. So if you were to say to the average church person, what makes God holy? You go, there's no sin in God. You go, what? Okay, uh, what would make a person holy? They don't have any sin. Um, can you define holiness without using the word sin? Um, that's hard. I mean, how are you supposed to show? That tells us that we only really understand the holiness of God when we go on a sin hunt. Because we think sin is an absence of the holiness of God. My question is, what came first? The holiness of God or sin? It's not rhetoric, really. What came first? The holiness of God or sin? Holiness of God. God is holy when he creates Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve haven't sinned yet. So if you have to see sin to see that God is holy, you have given more authority to sin than you have to the holiness of God. So sin is not the transverse. It's not the, it's not the underlying part of holiness. It's the absolute diametric op opposition to holiness. However, a little calamity in the world actually can make you a better person. It really can. Because what happens is a little calamity in the world helps you find out who you are. A little calamity in your world, and I'm not talking about planet Earth just. Sometimes I am. I mean, yeah, 
Chaos in weather purifies the atmosphere. I mean, it's called a hurricane, but it actually purifies the atmosphere at the end of the summer. It, it, it purifies the ocean that it's over and it purifies the sky and prepares us for winter. It actually brings in the jet stream that we need to move into the next season. Now, what happens though if you build your house in front of the hurricane? Well, the chaos is pretty destructive, but there's actually something positive that's happening. It's not the result of sin. <laughs> we got that hurricane coming out, it's because them riverboat gamblers. I remember when I was, I remember when I was a kid, I grew up in Missouri and right along the Mississippi River, and that was the always, somebody would always bring that up in a revival if it was in the fall. They'd go, yeah, everybody see that hurricane coming? I tell you, it's because of those riverboat gambling laws. Next time it comes around, you need to vote that out or the wrath of God's coming. And it was really, the atmosphere was being purified by a hurricane, but we had that. That was, Lord, who sinned, the gamblers or the gays? It was always something like that. It was always something, it was always, and, and I think Jesus would have said, Neither anyone sinned, but my father will get some glory from this if you'll let him, if you'll watch for it, if you'll wait for it. I might even give you guys a chance to help. I might give you a chance to clothe someone who doesn't have any clothes or feed someone who's hungry or help somebody rebuild their house. I might give you a chance to go help restore some order if you really care. I mean, if you just want to have a revival and scream about somebody that you don't like and what sin they're committing, then you're probably not going to be worth much in the world. But if you're willing to go restore some order, my father could be glorified through that. What I found a lot of times is we just wanted something to scream about in revival. We didn't really want to go restore anything. Yeah. So under, the underlying of order is chaos. A little chaos is not. Yes, it's necessary from time to time. Why? It makes a purification happen. It actually sharpens you. It makes you, it makes you reorganize. It could kill you or you could find something worth living for in the middle of all of your problems. This will help you deal with physical suffering. It'll help you deal with mental suffering. It'll help you deal with financial strain. What's my purpose on the earth? Why am I here? What am I doing? Otherwise, it's going to swallow me. But I could be sharper on the other side of this. So I had a financial meltdown. I might learn how to spend my money better if I paid attention. So I had a physical breakdown. I might learn how to take better care of my body if I paid attention. What good could I get out of the chaos? Well, it could kill me. But it also could establish the order that sets up the trajectory of the rest of my life. Now, that sounds like something good happened out of something bad. In particular, how does chaos in life slow down the clock? I think that, have you ever noticed this? Whenever, this is, this, I only use this as an example of why a little chaos in your life is not a bad thing. In fact, embrace it from time to time because you're going to learn something and it'll help you. Um, have you ever noticed that whenever you are doing something unfamiliar in life, like your daily routine changes, you, you get a new job? or you move into a new house, or you start school after the summer, things go real slow. Like, gosh, this week took forever. You're getting a new job. You don't know anybody you're working with. You don't know any of the routines. And then the longer you're there, have you noticed things speed up? Like, what happened to the school year? It was over with in the summer. We noticed this this summer. We talked about this. Our son come back from school. This was the first summer of coming home from school. And so our lives got in a routine last year. And like every day just kind of clocks off and you look up and they go, what, what happened in November? What happened in December? And then Lucas came home in May and he starts playing ball. So we're going three nights a week to ballparks and uh, he starts a job. And so all this stuff happened. And I remember we got to the end of the summer. It was like, is it, is it time for him to go back to school yet? Like, because this has been the longest summer of our lives. <laughs> It's not, no, it wasn't bad because it's not always bad. It, but I noticed that the clock slows down because your brain's processing the unfamiliar. And when your brain starts processing the unfamiliar, it slows it down. Now the clock's literally moving at the same speed for the rest of the world and for you, but your brain isn't processing it that way because chaos has been thrown into your order. It's why whenever a sickness happens, you have to go in the hospital or you have a wreck or there's something traumatic, everything slows down immensely. Like, why did that funeral weekend take so long? Because your brain didn't know what was around the next corner, not the entire weekend. And not knowing what's around the next corner is extremely stressful, AKA chaos, but you could, you will get through it. And what happens is as you become more familiar with the corners, the clock seems to speed back up. Point being, why is a little chaos good for your life? because sometimes you need to slow down. How do you, this is why we go on vacation because we don't go on vacation to the place we stay at work all week. 
we go somewhere that the clock will slow down because we don't need to know what's happening next. We need to throw chaos into our order because a little chaos in our order will make us appreciate the order when we get it back. Because we've, this is why you come home from vacation exhausted. You ever notice that? We all do. I mean, we're rested, but we're tired. We're like, well, I gotta get home so I can sleep. The reason for that is you, you've went into a chaotic mode where your brain is processing new things every second of every day and it gets tired and it goes, you know what I'd like now? I'd like to go back to work. I'd like to go back to school. I'd like to go back to my house. Why? I want a little order back in my life. I need a little order for all this stuff. And so we, we use that to slow down. So stop viewing all the bad things happening in your life as the justice of God. Jesus didn't. If Jesus didn't, why would you? And stop viewing all the bad things in your life as the result of someone's sin. Guess what? Not everything that goes wrong in life is someone's sin. Some things that go wrong in life is someone's sin. Sometimes you can bring on the kind of chaos that will cripple you and destroy things that can't, you can't restore order. But don't assume that calamity is the end result of somebody has failed. If you do, you will go into your moments with the man born blind like the disciples instead of like Jesus. And Jesus is about to bring them together with a we instead of an I, which we're going to see as we go. So, uh, next screen. The kingdom of God on the earth. Put a little thought into this today. I really just wanted you to see. I really want you to see the cross. Okay? So think about this statement. The kingdom of God on the earth is manifested in the judgment and defeat of sin. When Jesus died on the cross, evil was judged at Calvary. Evil is not going to meet its judgment. Evil met its judgment. Evil was judged at the cross. The kingdom of God on the earth is not a tangible thing you can touch. The kingdom of God on the earth is that the king has come and conquered his enemy. It's not the king is coming to get an army ready to conquer his enemy. It's the king has come and conquered his enemy. The kingdom of God is not the removal of calamity and chaos. Or let's say it this way. The kingdom of God is not the removal of the possibility of calamity and chaos. God puts you in a garden with all the fruit in the world and tells you and tells Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Why does God put a tree in there you're not supposed to eat and let a snake run around and talk to you? And this is an age-old theological conundrum. Why does God put a tree in the middle of the garden and let a snake run around having conversations with his, with his people? Wouldn't it have been easier if God put no tree of the knowledge of good and evil and didn't let any snakes in the garden? Sure, it'd be easier. And you'd be useless. Because you would never know how to overcome adversity. And you would never know how to overcome calamity. Perfection in the kingdom is not the lack of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the lack of snakes. Perfection in the kingdom is a people that know how to overcome them, that realizes they've already been judged at Calvary and that know how to face them. It's the job of the cross to deal with sin. It's the honor of sons to deal with chaos. The cross has dealt with your sin. Now you're going to have to deal with your stuff. Stop putting your stuff off. Stop hiding and start putting your stuff out there in front of the Lord. Seek the Holy Spirit who is your paraclete, your helper and walking in, in all of those areas of chaos. I go, what can I learn in this? And how can I avoid this overwhelming me and overcoming me? This will make your walk a whole lot easier instead of, God, what's wrong? Why is all this junk happening to me? You go, junk happens. God can be glorified. So what am I going to do in the middle of it? Listen, the, the, op the opposite of this is to stand up here and go, listen, man, the closer you get to God and the more you walk in God's favor, the fewer problems you're going to have. And, you'll, and we can amen it and buy the book and put the t-shirt on. We go back out there and problems hit us and we're completely clueless. And what that does is puts us under condemnation. Because we go, well, he said, pastor said, the more I'm walking in favor, the less thought this stuff will happen to me. I must not be walking in favor. What's wrong with me? And then you come back and go, hey, what's wrong with me? Here's my question is, what's wrong with me? I'm reading the Bible. I, used to, I got this question when I, come out, when I started ministering grace. And I didn't understand what I'm preaching to you tonight. So I would get people saying, 
I don't, man, I don't know. It ain't working for me. I, I'm, I'm reading what you said to read and I'm listening and I'm, I'm believing God and I trust to finish work and I'm walking in, I'm supposed to be walking in favor, but I got this and this and this and this going on. And I don't know what's up. Am I doing something wrong? Am I believing wrong? Am I confessing wrong? Am I quoting the wrong verses? What am I doing wrong? And it's, it's always the who sinned. But that's all we left them with as we went, listen, if you get in God's grace, you really walk into finished work, all this other stuff is going to look strangely dim. None of that's going to come nigh you. If we hadn't lied to people, if we had just been honest and went, look, you're going to walk in favor and junk's going to happen. And it's going to happen sometimes in waves. But the Father can be glorified. Stop blaming it all on who failed. And realize that it has nothing to do with you not being favored and you not walking in faith. It has to do with the fact that the kingdom of God did not promise you a garden free of snakes and did not promise you a garden free of the wrong tree. But the Holy Spirit in you promised you that you can tread on serpents and scorpions and you can live at the tree of life. Now start doing it. And quit wondering why there's junk in your life. There's just junk. And it happens to all of us. And the Father can be glorified. Now, I wish I'd heard that. I, I wish I'd heard that 10 years ago. I wish I'd heard it five years ago. I didn't learn it because, you know, I learned it from going through junk. And keep going back to the Father going, when's the junk going to go away? I'm in grace. I'm not supposed to be having all these problems. The father says, son, go back to the garden. This is why for like two years in my preaching, I kept going back to the garden in all my sermons. That was the Holy Spirit taking me back to the garden. He kept taking me back to the garden to watch Adam and Eve. And I did sermons on Adam and Eve and talking to the serpent and, and uh, Cain and Abel and all of these messages. And it was the Holy Spirit going, go back to the beginning and watch that when I put you in a place, it's the best place for you to be. I don't remove the enemy from that place. I just equip you. And one of the first messages I preached to our group, I came to Georgia. We were at some little church over here. I don't know how many of you were there that night. And I preached to you about Jesus going into the wilderness and talking to the, to the devil. And that was, we took you back to the garden. That was me working all that stuff. In my own spirit, going, why does bad things happen in good people's lives? When's God going to take all this stuff away? And I'm coming into the realization going, God's not taking it all away. He's better served to have children that know how to defeat enemies than that know how to hide from them. And you'll be better in the earth. You'll be a better spouse. You'll be a better parent. You'll be a better employer. You'll be a better employee. You'll be a better person on your street if you know how to deal with the junk that happens because junk's going to happen. This is an important part. I know I've slowed way down to cover some of that stuff together tonight, but let's put two verses together. I want to show you something. John 9, 3 and 4. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Okay. There's been some debate in scholarly circles about punctuation. The Greek does not punctuate. And therefore, when you see things like comma, quote, comma, period, semicolon, period, they're just, they're the work of translators. So the translators are trying to st structure the syntax of the sentence, make sense so that it reads properly. So you can read this stuff in the Greek, there's no periods, it's just all run on sentences. And so there's been some debate because I think we've tried to work our way around the fact that Maybe it looks like Jesus is saying the man is blind because God made him that way so that God could heal him. Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And so we read that first sentence and we go, well, see, Jesus is admitting the father made him blind so that God's glory could come out in him. And so what's happened is I've heard scholars say that there's no period right here because there isn't in the Greek, and so that maybe they put a wrong punctuation. So what it should say is neither this man nor his parents sinned, period, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Um, my problem with that is a little bit run on. It's, it's, it's also off, awful literature. That's why nobody put the period there, because it rambles. It's G and it starts with a conjunction, which is awful. And so... <laughs> A rebuttal conjunction at that, which is very difficult, but it can be done. But I'm no English grammar, grammar expert, but there's a better explanation than the periods and the commas are in the wrong spot. 
Jesus never says, Daddy made him blind so Dad can look good. Jesus leans into the idea that everybody else already had in the world, bad things happen in the world. The question that they had was not, did God make him blind? Their question was, is he blind because someone sinned? Is he blind because there was a failure? And Jesus goes, no, because not all problems are results of failure. This man is setting in front of us today so that dad can be glorified. Okay? He was blind either way, but he's setting in front of us today so that the father can be glorified, so that glory can be brought into who he is. Let me, let me, let me show you this. We must change our mentality. The works of God are not best revealed in judgment. The works of God are best revealed in deliverance. For instance, if you see Sodom and Gomorrah as God on a sin hunt, which most people do, what's Sodom and Gomorrah about? God's going to go down there and mess some people up for their sin. If you see God as on a sin hunt, then you might miss the miracle that the story is the deliverance of a man and his family. So if I were to ask you tonight, hey, can you guys relate to me the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Most people in the church would say Sodom and Gomorrah was a filthy city full of sin. We'd also somehow throw sexual impurity and homosexuals and all kinds of vileness in there. We'd have this thing stacked up and go, God hated it. So God come down and burn them with fire and brimstone, kill them, knock them off the face of the earth. You can tell the same story and say this. Sodom and Gomorrah is a story of two, two doomed cities and God loved them enough that he sent a messenger into the city so he could deliver the righteous. I just told you the same story. Well, you're just twisting the perspective. The story follows angels into the city and follows the righteous out. The story doesn't focus on the sin as much as it focuses on the righteous. Abraham doesn't pray, Father, God, if you could find just a little less sin, would you spare it? Yeah, I'd spare it if there was a little less sin. If you could find even less sin, would you spare it? If you found a little more sin than that, would you spare it? If you found just a little more sin than that, would you spare it? Okay, if you found that they had sinned a little more than even that, would you still spare it? No, it's the opposite. If you found 50 people righteous, would you spare it? Yeah. What if you found 40? Yeah. What if you could only find 30? How's Abraham praying? I know your heart. Your heart's righteous people. You, love, you want to save them. That's why you're here. You wouldn't have come told me this if you didn't want me to pray for righteous people. I don't need to pray for the sinners. You, they're all doomed. But it's the righteous. He goes, what about 20? What about 10? And of course I've always wondered, what if he'd have said one? What if he'd have went, oh, I know you're probably going to get ticked off. But what about one? If you could find one righteous, would you spare it? You don't have to answer this, but what do you think God would have said? That might show you your mentality about the heart of God. All right, Change our mentality. The works of God are not best revealed in judgment. Why do we think so? The works of God are best revealed in deliverance. John 9, 4. I'm trying to close. I must work the works of him who sent me. Well, today the night is coming when no one can work. Let me explain this real quick. Day and night are common metaphors for life and death in the text. The day of opportunity. This is what Jesus is saying. The day of opportunity is upon you. Seize it. Night will come soon enough. This is a good principle for life. The day is here. Work while it's day. Night's coming when no man can work. What's Jesus mean? I think this is insight into the urgency of Jesus' mandate. Jesus knows he doesn't have much time. They, remember, John 8, they pick up rocks to stone him. So whether this happened right after that or not, what's relevant in the way John laid it out is that Jesus just had his life flash before his eyes at the foot of the temple. They pick up rocks to kill him. He knows it's not his time yet, but he has a sense of urgency inside of him. The human side of him goes, you know, we only got so much time. We've got to work while it's daylight because the night's coming. I can't do this anymore. So we've got to get busy. We've got to stop standing around arguing about the theology of blind people and make somebody see. Or as I like to say, work out the theology later, fix the man now. That's what Jesus is saying. Because why does he throw this in right at the backside of, you know, Supposed to, my father's supposed to be glorified. I got work to do. Guys, it's, it's daylight, but it's turning dark. I gotta, get, I gotta do this. In other words, you guys work out your theology of sin later. We gotta fix people. You know what? That would help if we would do that in life. If you'd quit trying to work out everybody's sin when you meet them and you'd just love them first, I hope you realize the sin issue's been taken care of by Jesus. If you could introduce them to good news instead of emphasize, this, I'm back on this horse, instead of emphasizing they're bad all the time, well, I was going to make sure they're sufficiently repentant. 
That's not your job to make sure. It is not your job to make sure anybody feels sufficiently bad about themselves. Who do you think you are? It has never been your ministry. What's your ministry? I make people feel condemned. That's not a ministry. That's demonic. <laughs> the ministry you've been given, 2 Corinthians 5, is a ministry of reconciliation, telling people their sins are not counted against them, that they've been reconciled unto God. That's your ministry. That's all of our ministry. Hey, God took care of your sin. Good news. Good news. He loves you. Good news. You can be reconciled to God. You don't have to wander anymore. No, it's not a rose garden. And if it is, there's thorns. Promise. There, is, there are thorns and bugs you won't like. But there's also roses. And if you had to have thorns and bugs you don't like to have roses, wouldn't you rather have thorns and bugs you don't like than no roses? And that's life. And that's good news. We get that. Day and night, common metaphors. Work out the theology later. Fix the man now. Next screen. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone. This is Lazarus, by the way. I'm showing you something. I, I'm, I don't want to stay here long because, man, we're going to be in. When we get at John 11, we're not getting out. We, that's where we get lost. But watch this. He, Jesus says this to his disciples. Let's go to Judea. Lazarus is in the tomb, by the way. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. You're going to go back there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. If one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light's not in him. What's this all about? 12 hours in the day, 12 hours in the night. Jesus knows his time's ticking. He goes, we got to go now. Because listen, you got 12 hours of work, 12 hours to be gone. It's another metaphor. We got to work while the day is here. Night's coming when nobody can work. All right, let's stack these up. Jesus is giving us a metaphor as a way to deal with the natural. Paul, on the other side of the darkness of the cross, flips that metaphor and spiritualizes it. And it looks like this in Romans 13. Watch Paul. Do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of your sleep. Now your salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Paul takes the same metaphor and flips it around. He says, we're on the other side of the darkness. Jesus said, it's day. It's going to be dark. I'm working. I'm going to go to the cross. Paul says, we're on the other side of that darkness of the cross. There's light upon us now. Let's live like it. Let's shake off who we used to be so we can move on into who we are. Let's put on the armor of light. Let's walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. I think Paul's using that as an illustration of things people do in the dark. Paul says, walk properly as if you lived in the daytime. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. I want to let you work with that, okay? Watch the metaphor of Jesus. It goes to the cross. Paul flips it over and takes it into the new covenant. So Jesus is working, working, working darkness at Calvary. Paul says, we're out of the darkness. Flip it over. The light's been turned on. Which kingdom are we in? We're in a kingdom where the light is shining. Let's stop living like we're in the dark. You're living in the dark if you're telling people this stuff's happening to them because of sin. It's walking in darkness. Walk in the light of who he is. Here's where we'll start next week. John chapter 9, verse 5. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. When he said these things, he spit on the ground made clay with his saliva and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went, washed and came back saying, next week, I want to deal with the spit in the dirt. I don't want to get hinky with it and crazy and go deep, 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 deep. But I think there's a reason there. Part of the reason is we're going to show you how Jesus varies his blind man healings. Healing the blind had never been done before in the history of the world until Jesus. And then he becomes a master at it, and he rarely does it the same way twice. And there's a reason for that. We're going to dig into that next week while we also talk about Salome. Salome is a part, or um, not a part. Salome is a picture of Jesus. It means sent. Jesus comes as the sent one and sends us out. We are Salome to the world. We're going to dig into all of this good stuff next week. It is going to be fun. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for what you've said to us tonight and through us. And I, I pray that we have been true to your word and we've shined a light on Jesus. And we all have calamity and chaos in our lives. There is no reason because we are on the other side of the darkness of the cross. There is no reason for us to believe that it is anything other than the world 
and the chaos and calamity that the world has to offer and that we don't have to go on a sin hunt in life. We just have to look for a way to glorify you in the midst of our stuff. And I thank you that, you are, that you've given us the Holy Spirit to do this. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.